I'm Mewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Rachel Hang, you might have seen a story in The New Yorker. I think it was spring of 21, before the Valley. So you definitely know her name. There's also a debut novel called The Suicide Club, which is a little different from The Great Reclamation. But The Great Reclamation, there is so much I love about this book. There is the characters I love, the setting I love. There's a slightly weird setup that's a little fun that we're going to get to. It involves some disappearing islands, which... I can hear some of you now saying, what? Disappearing Islands. But it's also the history of a place and a culture and a people. And it is so gorgeous, this book. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us on Port Over. It's really nice to meet you finally. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's so great to be here. So here's a question. You grew up in Singapore, but you've been studying in the States. And you were at Columbia. You also did your MFA at the Michener Center in Austin, which... You have some pretty great colleagues from that neck of the woods. A lot of writers I love who've come out of that program. And The Great Reclamation is really, really different from The Suicide Club, Mm -hmm. which was dystopian. It was New York. It was a play on wellness culture. If you haven't read it, folks, you should go out and read it. But The Great Reclamation is one of these epic stories. But it's an epic story of a place that not every American knows. It's Singapore. Mm -hmm. So... Can we talk a little bit about where this book came from? Because I feel like it's very different from Suicide Club. Yeah, yeah. And and thank you for mentioning Suicide Club as well. I think it's interesting when I did my very first interview um, for my first novel, even though it was this dystopian novel set in New York and so on, it was with the Singapore um, newspaper. And the journalist said, she's like, oh, well, I read this and, you know, it's set in New York and it's in the future but it feels very much like you are writing about Singapore. Like it's a society in which, you know, success is very narrowly defined and there are these sorts of like, you know, controls over certain things. And so I think even though it does seem like a very different book, you know, doing going back into history and writing about land reclamation in Singapore, in a way it does feel like a sort of organic continuation of all my writing. And as you know, in in my short stories, I frequently am writing about present day and historical Singapore as well. And so for this book, I guess what inspired it was, well, land reclamation itself, really. I, you know, I grew up in Singapore um, in primary school, I remember, which is kind of like elementary school here. I remember being in the classroom and a teacher saying, um, you know, where we're sitting right now used to be the sea. And that just totally stuck in my mind. And every Singapore kid learns about land reclamation at some point, right? It's part of this Uh, you know, like concern or narrative that, you know, the country is very small, just tiny. It's literally, you can cross the island in like an hour, an hour's drive. So land reclamation has been a big initiative to like increase just the size of the island. And I think it's grown in size by about 25% since the 60s. You know, as a kid, you don't know any of that. You're just like, wow, this sounds like magical, like, and scary. You know, how is it that where we, how could this be the sea? How could this be land? How can that just... (laughs) happen. And I think that speaks to a particular quality of, of life in Singapore and growing up in Singapore and all of these huge changes that you see happening before your eyes. And like you say, you know, maybe um, many Americans aren't that familiar with his Singaporean history or Singapore at all, but most people would have seen crazy rich Asians. Right. Um, and you would have seen, you know, the, the skyline, right, of the like mm-hmm. big hotels and the, the really beautiful, you know, with the boat on the top. And even that skyline, is something that came up in the last 40, 50 years or so. Even in my lifetime growing up in Singapore, I would drive past places that used to be either, you know, trees or the sea or, or flat. And then you'd come back a couple of years later and there would be huge buildings there. So that that those hotels in the crazy rich Asian skyline is yeah. built on land. And so I think growing up with all of that happening around you and constantly having the ground shifting and like buildings going up and coming down and roads changing, it raises questions about, I guess, memory and the stories yeah. and who we are and how you, you know, how you hold on to, to the past and what does it mean when everything is changing so much so quickly? And I think that's the feeling out of which this book came. Yeah. And as a reader, I got a real sense of sort of this thrust of change. It's so fast. And it's so intense. And some people buy into the change and some people super do not buy into the change. And obviously that's where the dramatic conflict comes and and a big part of the narrative engine for this novel comes from that conflict. And, you know, when you talk about land reclamation too, I mean, Boston's Back Bay reclaimed land, you know, Battery Park City in Manhattan reclaimed land. (laughs) Like, 
you know, Singapore isn't the only place where this is happening. And, you know, how much do we give up people in exchange for sort of future promises, right? Like I'm using air quotes because I, you don't really control the future. It comes no matter what. Mm -hmm. And it was wild to me the way you handled time mm -hmm. in this novel. And when we open up and it's just like, oh, wait, okay, where am I in time and space? And we meet this kid, Aboon, who essentially we follow him to adulthood. Was he the first character who showed up for you? Because he's a very special kid when we first meet him. Um, yes, he was the first character. It actually came out of a short story I wrote. While I was, I was working on the research for this novel and I had started a draft that was written in a totally like straight historical vein with no, you know, speculative bent or magic right, at all. Right, right, right. And it wasn't working. So I threw it out. And then I wrote uh -huh. a short story that actually is now a, a chapter in the middle of the book. It's when the government first come to the village. And that was a story oh. of Abuna as a character. So he was there sitting, you know, on the steps of his house and seeing these people come in into the swamp and like measuring the ground. And, right. You know, putting Legs into the earth. Um, so he showed up right from the very beginning, I would say. And then after writing that story, I wanted to know more about him as a character and kind of to go back into the past. So then I wrote backwards 20 years. And that's why the book spans, you know, the 20 years before that and then the, the few right. years. That it's what, because we go essentially from sort of late 30s, early 40s into the early 60s. Let's, let's say 65. I think we go up to 60. One. I can totally see why you would want to take that period and, mm -hmm. and build a novel around it. But can we talk about this fisherman's family for a second? Because obviously they are not among the wealthy. They are not among those who are having an easier time of things. And in fact, you know, they're hiding the secret from a community where everyone does, they share everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't sort of keep secrets in this tiny community. How much research did you have to do into the Kempong? A lot of research, I guess, is the is the quick answer. Um, I probably spent about a year doing research, like just reading, going into archives before I even started writing. And then as I was writing, I would continue researching um, when I needed to know about like a specific aspect of life or like a particular historical period or event. But honestly, the research was really enjoyable because I think I wouldn't have decided to write this book if I wasn't interested in this time period. So for me, it was just really, really fascinating to like dive into the archives and like look up oral history interviews of like, I don't know, people living through this change, the interviews of people who lived along the coast when the land reclamation was happening and like seeing, seeing the, the coast move out, seeing the buildings go up, you know, and talking about like, oh, all the dust that's coming and all the crabs that are disappearing. And, you know, all these little details that I, I wouldn't have gotten if I hadn't had access to, you know, the archival material. Yeah, I really loved doing the research um, and then reading kind of about geography and history, but also politics and, you know, all the different events that were happening at the time, not just in Singapore, but also in the wider region and in the world, because this was part of a, you know, global wave of of colonialism right across um, the British Empire yeah it was like a year plus of pure research and then lots of follow-up research what surprised you the most from your research oh gosh so many things I think one of the things that I read about that maybe didn't surprise me but was so so unlikely or like so surreal was the conveyor belt I write about the conveyor belt in the book um that was a real thing so they're mm -hmm. actual folk this conveyor belt that they built in order to move the fill material. So they had dug out this hill that was some kilometers from the coast and they cut down the hill and they dug a reservoir. So today that reservoir exists today. I've been there many times. And then they built the conveyor belt to shift the dirt from that spot uh, all the way to the coast. And I don't know exactly why. I couldn't find out exactly why. In my book, I say, well, it was cheaper to do it that way than to, you know, hire truck drivers. But, but you see photos of it and it's, it looks just like something out of a, a movie you know it looks made up like it doesn't look like it could have existed but it did wait so is that how you got to this idea of islands that appear and disappear with the cycles of the moon I think that was more that that is pure fiction um and you know based in part on folklore and you know okay. just like coastal vagaries I wanted the book to feel like a shift 
in reality, I guess, from like one kind of reality or one type of narrative about the mm -hmm. world to it. And I think the early section of the book where there are these disappearing islands is right. a time when things were less known or pinned down or named in a certain way, right? And then I think when after the war and we shift into this like independence um, nation building mode, then it's much more about sort of concrete things or this technocratic model of living where we know everything, we name everything, everything is categorized, we have these like efficient plans in place to build this modern nation. And so I think the islands sort of stand in contrast to that future that we eventually get to because the islands are slippery, they're ungraspable. Um, they're, they're not always there. They can't be, you know, pinned down. Well, they can't be pinned down and they also just can't be contained. You can't just say, I claim this in the name of X, Y, or Z, which is obviously a lot of what has happened throughout the history of Asia. I mean, I'm part Taiwanese. I mean, if you want to talk about a complicated country history, and there are so many people who have opinions about Taiwan who really should possibly not share those opinions because they're not well thought out. <laughs> And you're just kind of like, okay. Actually, one of the books that really inspired me that I loved a lot, I just remember, is by a Taiwanese author, um, Wu Ming Yi, the man with oh. the top-down eyes. And he writes about land. And there is yeah, a bit yeah, of, yeah. Well, I love that. And he writes about, I guess, similar questions and themes. And yeah, so it's really cool that you mentioned that. Well, it's trippy too, because if you think about it, Taiwan went from being a Portuguese colony, which, okay, to a Japanese colony. And, you know, then of course we have you know, Chiang Kai-shek and his folks roll in and it's just kind of like, but yet at the same time, it's really becoming its own place. Mm -hmm. And however people feel about the directions it's going or what its neighbors might think of the directions and whatnot, it's just to see this country emerge from a colonial legacy. And somehow the Brits, I don't really understand how the, maybe they were distracted by Hong Kong and Singapore and Malaysia. I don't really know, but Taiwan never hit their radar. So you know, there was a whole different direction that kind of happened for that country. But it's just one of those places like Singapore that's so wildly unique. I think that's the best way to describe it. I mean, Singapore, it's a polyglot, like you have multiple languages. So, I mean, you have all of these different ways that you can pull story in, and yet you've created this amazing family and this amazing community. I love Abun and his story arc I'm going to sit here quietly and not ruin anything for anyone because it's, fab it's fabulous. It's fabulous. It's inevitable. It's everything you would hope for in a novel with this kind of sweep. But how do you take all of that research and all of the things that you know about the place that you grew up in and turn it into a story that really moves with characters that I am so deeply invested in? <laughs> I guess, it, like all fiction, it, it starts with character. You know, it's like, yes, I'm interested in all of these like big historical, political, geographical questions, but ultimately I, I am Singaporean and I grew up in Singapore and these are real, you know, real people that I, I know, I see, you know, that like Abun feels to me like a particular character of a generation, you know, my grandparents' generation, the kind of person that I know very well and that I, you know, I encounter every day, not in my current life, but when I was growing up and whenever I go home, it was very important to filter all of those big questions, big themes through the very human, very intimate perspective of like these characters and their relationships. And all the characters feel incredibly close to me and dear to me. Um, you know, they all feel like people I know or could know and are maybe all parts of myself really when, when as, as like all fiction, fictional creations are of their writers. Yeah, I think always filtering it down to Abu and his relationships. And it was helpful also that, or deliberate, that he was a, a child when we met him. Yeah. Because like, having that like childlike lens um, and the naivety and the fact that he didn't understand these changes, he didn't understand what was going, you know, happening to his country and the place around him. We kind of learn, or the reader learns at the same time as Abu is learning. So having that filter allowed us, allowed me to really narrow in on like him his family his community there's a lot of love in this family and there's a lot of making do with what you have kind of thing but Abun and his uncle ultimately have very different views of the world and I knew it was coming and I'm not spoiling anything here readers will they will understand <laughs> it will be clear but at the same time just see that and to not lose sight of the fact that these characters do love each other and they just, they're kind of bewildered by each other, I think is what I'm trying to say, that 
you know, here they are in this family and they just can't figure it out. They yeah. can't find the middle ground. It, it feels very au courant. <laughs> it feels very of the moment, no matter where you live. But also they're men and they just don't have the language. <laughs> yeah. They don't yeah. have the language. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. It's like they're men of a particular place and time and culture as well. Yeah. 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 And I, I guess like you say, it happens everywhere, right? Ways in which like the indiv- those individual relationships are like shaped by, you know, politics and class and all these things. Even within, you know, I was just thinking about my, my mother's own family. So my grand they disagreed on at the time you could say you could go either to Chinese school or English school. And you see uh-huh. Abu me in the story they go to a Chinese speaking school but they were different language schools and they meant very different things right because English schools were run essentially by you know not necessarily the British but like often Catholic nuns but it would be access into a different kind of life and Chinese schools were associated with like you know communism and China and all these other things so even within my own family my grandparents disagreed on you know where to send their kids and they finally came up with a solution like they would alternate so one fam one kid would go to Chinese school and the next one would go to English school and the next one would go to Chinese school so it's just like even within the same family, you have mm-hmm. totally different experiences and ideologies that are completely formative, right? And so I think that's something I wanted to bring into the book. And so you see there is there are those tensions, there are those conflicts um, as you bring up across generations, but also even within the generations themselves, because, you know, as it is in real life, we don't all agree just because we all grew up at the same time even if we're from the same place or the same family. Well, I'm thinking about Natalie and Sukme, if they'd ever met. <laughs> <It would Yeah. laughs> be, I don't know what they would talk about. They do meet. They meet very briefly at the community center. And then it's kind of an awkward. Like, <laughs> but they don't speak. And it's, no. <laughs> I mean, like if they sat down over a cup of coffee, I, it would be a very strange conversation, I think. Um, I think they would both just end up staring at each other until someone says <laughs> Or they would talk about Abu and I don't know. <laughs> and maybe, maybe. But I I do love the idea that they each, and Natalie's story, I really appreciated Natalie's story. I felt like she had a couple of surprises that I did not expect. And I always love it when I'm surprised by something in a novel. And certainly I know enough about Singapore. You know, mm-hmm. I can locate Singapore on a map. <laughs> I would love to go to the airport someday. I've heard stories yeah. about that airport. I would like to it's see amazing. it myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, there's some things I would like. I mean, I could fly through. But at the same time, all of these characters feel really fresh and really interesting. And even Aboon's mother is kind of like, she's ahead of her time. She's really ahead of her time. She's like, no, no, no. This son, my other son can be a fisherman. This son is going to go to school, which for a woman in her position, this is kind of outrageous. Yeah, yeah. Again, that that came from my grandmother. So my okay. grandmother was, you know, she grew up in an immensely poor family. She never, she was illiterate. She spoke only Hokkien, and then she knew some Mandarin. She was the one fighting for her children to go to English school because she said it's important for them to learn English because that's the direction the country is going in, and they're going to be able to get jobs if they can speak English. And my grandfather was hugely against it. So that's how they struck the bargain of like half the family would go to English school and half to Chinese school. So I think there are, you know, these people of that generation, especially mothers, maybe, where, you know, with all the love and concern you have for your child, very sensitive to, you know, the ways in which the world is changing and always aware of, like, you know, survival and wanting the best for their kids. So I think the mother in the book is, like, one of those characters. Well, and also, honestly, I mean, there's so much, like, the speed at which this all of this change is happening to this community. And yeah, you are talking about sort of decades in the history of the book, but I mean, if I were one of these characters, I would be thinking this is happening so fast. I don't really know what to make of it and I don't have all the parts. But education is the thing that makes you, it means you can deal with change. It means you can figure some things out. And yet it's not a perfect solution. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of hard to yeah well you see the ways in which once yeah. Abu goes to school he is in a way estranged from his community right, right. so that, there's a kind of sadness in that as well do you have a favorite moment from the great reclamation do you have something that we can talk about that isn't a spoiler <laughs> favorite moment that's not a spoiler I think the moment where they try to find the island again so there's the disappearing yeah. island and they they discover them at first and they're like oh my gosh they're islands here they're not meant to be islands here and then they go back and they're like they're gone and nobody believes them everybody thinks they're crazy right 
and then you know Abu and his father and everyone they go into this like silent space of like okay this strange thing happened to us and we're just not going to talk about it and then at some point Abun's father is like, I think I know how to find them. And he brings Abun back out to sea alone. And then they actually manage to find them. And there is this closeness between Abun and his father when previously, you know, they were always like slightly distant and they didn't know how to relate to each other. And it's the finding of this, these beautiful islands that kind of brings them together as father and son for the first time and is a moment of like real joy and connection and like discovery for them. So I think I that's definitely one of my favorite moments early on in the book. I bought into this world so completely from the first page, without a doubt, absolutely, to believe every single word mm-hmm. was true. And I really, I wanted to know what was going on with this father and son, and I wanted to know where you were going to take me. Mm-hmm. And every time I met someone in this book, you know, you take a couple of minutes, and, and there's Sukme, he's amazing. I mean... We meet some really fantastic people, but talking about the structure, though, how do you balance, you know, the research and the movement of the the story and, and also just all of the things you want to cover, all of the things you want to do yeah. in a novel? Yeah, I think I knew where it was going to end, so that was okay. helpful. So okay. I, you know, I had that middle chapter of, of when, you know, the, the government first come to the, the compound sees them for the first time and I knew where it was going to end so I knew what I was writing and then I had to I had to figure out the beginning so like why is Abun why does he become the person that he becomes so that he goes on to do the things that he does I always had a loose structure in my mind um, okay and I initially thought it would be three parts there mm-hmm. would be the section and then there would be the the ending section in the independence period right when the British first leave and then there would be the the past, so 20 years ago before the war. And then as I wrote, I realized I had to fill out some things, you know, for it to make sense. So then it ended okay. up being five parts, which is what the book is now. Um, so there, there is the period, in, it starts in the 1940s before the war, and then the war happens. And then there's the 1950s where Siok may have this kind of coming of age when they first go to school outside the village. And then the middle section where the government first arrived, and then the fourth and fifth section, which right. I won't spoil no. Um, so <laughs> let's I, not. <laughs> once, I had, once I had that um, like five part structure, I knew roughly, you know, what would happen in each section. Um, and that really helped tracking all the different plot lines and all the different characters. Because it is also a multi, multi point of view novel. You have Abun as the main character, but yeah, into like maybe five or six different other characters' points of view. And so I guess I had a lot of post it notes. Um, a lot of uh, little note cards. At some point I had a big, I think when I was writing my second draft and editing, I had like a big piece of paper, like a butcher block block sheet. And Mm -hmm. I just put all the chapters on note cards and color coded them for like which character's point of view it was. And sometimes it would be like three different characters in one chapter. So I had to put like three different sticky notes. And then I put it all up on this board. And that was my first like big attempt at revising Um, and like putting the cards around and figuring out like, okay, which chapters do we keep? Which chapters do we and like which you know which characters are like not helping the narrative or like too confusing or too much digression um at the same time i wanted it to have that digressive quality because to me it's a story of a community you know it's not just a single character like coming of age it's like it's this story of this community in this country so i wanted it to be kind of polyphonic in a way if it could be um so like balancing that right like having the breadth of perspective but also to keep it moving forward enough so people aren't, you know, like, oh my God, where is this going? It's going to be a million pages. Yeah, it was a whole process. Um, many, many rounds of revision. I had um, amazing input from my wonderful agent and editor, and I did massive, quite a bit of structural uh, revision, even after we had sold the book to Riverhead. So that was, as with all books, maybe maybe some more than others, you know, a, an ongoing iterative process. You totally answered my next question, which was how much of writing is rewriting for you? And it sounds like, oh gosh, like all of it. Just, yeah. You <laughs> like just 90%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's really important. I, you know, I think it's easy sometimes when you see a book out in the world and think, oh, well, that person made it look really easy. <laughs> like, those are usually the ones. Do, right. Cause you do hear about people who are Absolutely. like, I buy a book in two months and this is the final version. Right. But, you know, maybe they've been like thinking about it or like marinating you know, in it for a long time. And that's also the writing that you don't see. That's absolutely true. I do think everyone needs an editor, though. (laughs) I think everyone needs an editor. 
I don't care who that person is, <laughs> but everyone needs an editor. And I think, you know, it's helpful too when you're when you're trying to keep track, as you said, of major storylines and and a cast and their emotions. There are a lot of feelings in this book. There's a lot of it. it it's so satisfying. It's just so all of the feels, Thank you. as they say, are in this book. But also for you, as you're doing the rewriting and you're doing, you know, sort of the rejiggering and figuring out, you know, what needs to go, which is a huge part of the process too. I mean, how much are you pulling from your formal MFA studies or how much of it is just, I'm going to trust in the process and see where it goes? Yeah, well, I guess I have a slightly different perspective on this because I wrote my whole first book before I went to the MFA. Um, oh. And I actually wrote my first book when I was I was working in London for the Singapore government um, as part of a scholarship I'd taken to go to college. Um, and so I didn't even know MFAs existed at that point. And when I discovered, then I was like, oh, I should go do one. And so then I, that's okay. when I MFA, which was after I had sold the first book. So I, I guess I've had both experiences, like one writing really much, like really like just on my own with like no input. At all. Like I think the first person aside from my husband who read my first book was my agent. I queried very early draft and then it was my editor and that was it. Like I didn't have any external from like, you know, mentors or other writers. Whereas this book was written within the MFA because I, I started it in my second year at Missioner. Um, and it was my thesis project. You know, I, I had a thesis advisor, the amazing Elizabeth McCracken. Who oh, she's the best. <laughs> she's a genius, a total genius. Um, yep. And I am hugely indebted to her for, you know, talking me off the cliff like many times with this book because I was just like, I can't do it, Elizabeth. It's just too much that, that you know, I don't know how to balance the history and the magic and all the stuff. So she would always have really just like wise, stabilizing, smart. Yeah. Oh, I, give me, that uh, I believe. And she also <laughs> read it many times. So she read it. I think two, three times possibly. Uh, so having that input was super helpful. I, you know, some of the big revisions I did um, to the character arcs, you know, came out of like my conversations with Elizabeth. At the same time, by the time I graduated, I think I was still only on like version three and this is like maybe version 10. So, you know, there was like a ton that I did on my own after I graduated. It was different, but it also wasn't that different from writing the first book. Because like, I did have the input and the support, more the emotional support and like the, you know, general, like the craft advice, but ultimately when you're writing a book, you are sort of on your own, whether in an MFA or, or not, like you, at the end of the day, you're sitting, you know, in front of your Word document yourself, like having to face down the, the page. <laughs> what did you learn writing Suicide Club that you used in The Great Reclamation? I think I learned that even when I felt like I should throw it out and that it was going nowhere and that it was terrible and like no one will ever want to read this and I hate everything that that feeling is temporary and that it's a matter of or maybe it's not maybe in the end you do have to throw it out but you'll never find out until you finish writing it and so I think having done it once um, I wouldn't say it became it became easier because I don't think it ever does as many people say every project has its own like new new learning you know things to learn and challenges but I did feel like I had the the faith to continue. Like it was a little easier. And, mm -hmm. and I think I needed it for this book because this book was so long. Like it was just, you know, the first right. draft was like much longer than this. It was just like, like 140,000 words or something, you know, with like oh. so many moving pieces and like keeping track of stuff and then cutting and adding and cutting and adding. So I think I needed to have that faith that it would work out in the end. Okay, wait, Suicide Club came out in 2018, it right? And you and I are talking in March of 2023. So wait, how many years did you spend on The Great Reclamation? I started writing it right as Suicide Club came out, so in 2018. And I sold it in 20, I think the fall of 2020. So really the bulk of the work has happened sort of in the last three years, maybe? I would say it, it probably from beginning to end, it was maybe four years from the wow. first draft to like final draft, maybe three and a half to four years. That feels so fast. And I'm just the reader and it feels so yeah. fast. <laughs> yeah. Because again, I just want to go back to the idea that this is an entire world. And yes, there is this sort of fantastical element of the islands, but that note is so grounded in this world and these people that it's just kind of like, okay, I buy it. I'm in. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm completely I in. And it just... It works. And then I got so wrapped up in the characters. And I know you don't necessarily, 
you can't really have a favorite character when you're writing this, obviously. But I sort of feel like you might. And I'm going <laughs> to ask anyway. <laughs> but I sort of feel like Aboon gets the most love mm-hmm. overall. I mean, you like your other characters too, but he really, there's okay. there's a compassion there for him that I think as a reader, I really needed to see. Yeah, I think again, um, you know, Abun to me feels like many a Singaporean person that I know yeah. of a of that generation. Mm-hmm. You know, when um, you know who was part of, but also um, also enacted this change. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I think it was important for me to like to kind of yeah to write them as like with as much complexity and compassion. Mm-hmm possible and it, it is my you know he is the main character so I guess mm. I ended up spending the most time with him I do have a soft spot for Siok Mei I think it's hard not to because she has such strong beliefs and she's so, she's so passionate and is such a like strong idealistic woman that I just feel like I really identify with her and I loved writing mm-hmm. um, and also like her path to some sort of like reconciliation and healing towards the end as well like I just yeah I I do. I wouldn't say she's my favorite character, but definitely soft spot for. Well, love is hard. Love is hard. <laughs> I saw someone describe Abun when I was researching. Someone described it as a character who loves too much. Yes. And I do. I think that's, you know, he and Sukhme, they love too much. I, I don't think Abun is the only character who loves too much, but I think it is possible, you know, to want to be part of something so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah you know it's it's gonna push you and it's gonna test you and it's it makes for great reading oh it's <laughs> such a great read yeah can we talk about some of your literary influences for a second though i know elizabeth mccracken who we all love i mean she what that woman can do on the page yeah is just fabulous but she's not the only person who's helped create rachel hang writer so can we talk about some of the other influences on you for sure, yes. Um, well, for this book specifically, I was very influenced by Edward P. Jones's The Known World. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it makes sense. I feel like every time I tell oh, people... it like, totally like, makes sense. It's I don't not, like to assume, though. <laughs> uh, an omniscient, you know, the way in which he, what he does with, like, time and point of yep. view. I also just love 19th century novels in general, but didn't want to, like, write a 19th century novel, like, in the exact thing. And I feel like he kind of has that, like, omniscient third perspective of the 19th century that I love so much but like in a contemporary way um, with the fluid of like moving in and out of different characters and getting very close to them the way time is like so circular in his fiction I really love that like with the foreshadowing and the returns and the repetition the way like a single moment can like expand and contract like I just I yeah I love that so I love yeah the novel but also his short fiction you know Lost in the City like yeah lots of his short stories I could go back to them again and again so that was very much a big influence. Um, I think the writer, a few writers of um, sort of speculative historical fiction, you know, so I mentioned Wu Ming Yi early on with the Compound Eyes, um, and that's translated. Uh, that's a really beautiful book about, I think, like land, a landslide that happens in Taiwan, um, and it's a magical element. And it's kind of hard to describe, but also combines this like very literal socio political issue with like something that's a little more fantastical and metaphorical sometimes you have to step to the side a little bit to be able to talk about the thing you want to talk about that you can't totally. actually talk about because yeah you just can't there yeah. there are guardrails in place and yeah, absolutely and it's complicated to like i think that's the thing that fiction can do right that it can be you can hold all of these like contradictory ideas that you couldn't necessarily get out in like something that was you know I don't know an essay or something or maybe something you can't write about that you can then like you know kind of convey through like embodied characters so I think yeah he does that wonderfully in the man with compound eyes um and then I really love Namwali Sapel's The Old Drift oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Section, um and you know goes through I think like I don't want to say I'm wrong but I think it's like a hundred years or something it's many many years it's intergenerational and it follows like three different families yeah. and this huge cast of characters and is historical, but also speculative and like goes into the future. So I think the like sweep and the range of that and the, mm-hmm. again, history at a slant, right? It's not just straight on like very sort of realist um, textbook sort of history. So I, I was very inspired by by mm-hmm. that and, and so many more. I could, I could go on. Well, I mean, 
also when you think about how history is written right like i mean i was a history major in college and there were times where you'd be working in a primary Jenny. source yeah but you're looking at a primary source and you're like i'm sorry what did you just say I'm like, <laughs> i mean and or you know let's just take american history at the moment like we're having many conversations about american history and the way people want to tell stories right and the way they want to talk about change and the way they talk about uh, you know where we sit in relation to our past and our future mm -hmm. like there are people who when they're talking about you know where we are they forget that we are actually sitting in what's going to become history yeah, yeah right like and also you can read a lot of history but if you're not using that information to do something else yeah yeah you might want to think about totally. it's kind of fascinating to me watching people respond to what is simply historical fact with a deep amount of emotion yeah well and also the way in which like certain histories are told and certain aren't right also known or not known like what is the official narrative what are the other narratives that you know, don't get as much airtime so yeah i think that like when saying something is like historically accurate like what does that mean right like accurate for who and like how and you know so yeah i think the beauty of writing historical fiction is to get into all of those questions i think we just need to get to the emotional truth of the thing right because i think the emotional truth is how you end up changing someone's mind right like how many times have you heard well you know, I related to this character more than I expected to, or, oh no, not that person. I know that person personally. So they're one of the good ones, fill in the blank of whatever, you know, the extreme. It's just, it's wild to me how, if you can make the stakes feel personal for people. Yeah, you wrote a novel set in Singapore, but at the same time, there's so many moments that I don't care where you grew up or what your background is. There are just so many great moments in the Great Reclamation. I mean, it's a big, messy love story, and, you know, it's a family story. I'm going to come back to the islands that disappear with the moon. I mean, that's just fun. Like, that's just a fun, weird thing, and yeah. yet it sets up the sort of runway to get into the story and it's yeah. great it's, it's so great <laughs> i keep saying great which is terrible this book really is i don't want to say sublime sublime is not the word i'm looking for and i can't think of the word i'm looking for which is we'll have to take sublime. <laughs> okay well then you can have sublime but it's just the experience of reading the great reclamation was so surprising and delightful and heartbreaking and it was all of the things that I want when I'm reading a novel. And I don't have to like everyone. I'm not saying I liked every character. I'm not saying I loved every story piece of the story. But as a whole, I did not want to put this book down at any point. Now, I did actually have to put it down at one point because I had to do some other, like, life interfered and I had to do some stuff. But this is really the kind of book where if you can sit down and read all of it in a single sitting. <laughs> That's delightful. I highly recommend it. But at the same time, it's a really special book. Do you miss this world? Do you miss your characters? I do. I do. Someone else asked me that recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the characters don't feel gone for me. I feel like yeah. they're still there. Um, yeah. And often I do find in my fiction, like characters do return, even if not in the exact same form, like bits of them appear elsewhere in other stories. So I don't feel like I've totally left them behind, which is not to say I would write like a sequel per se, but they'll come back in different forms. Yeah, I know I said it at the top of the show, but Beyond the Valley, your story that ran in The New Yorker, it's not the same in any way, shape or form, but I just feel like those characters know these characters. <laughs> yeah. You know, they might be related. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit. What do you want listeners to know about the Singapore that you're writing about? Since this is a largely American audience, and mm -hmm. just about the context in which Singapore tends to be known, which most mm -hmm. recently is probably Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah. You know, movie. <laughs> it really is. I guess just knowing that, that that's, that's a very, very small, obviously, you know, and obviously we know this, like a very, very tiny segment of Singapore's population. It's like doing a movie about like the Kardashians and the world taking that to be like literally all of America, right? And so I think hopefully this book will provide a, a slightly different perspective. And also to know that, you know, this, this feels like it's in the distant past, but it's really not. It's like from the, you know, it goes up to the 60s, like our parents, my parents' generation, my grandparents lived through this. So 
the crazy rich asian singapore is incredibly new it's something you know even just the physical landscape only appeared in the last like 30 40 years so i think that's hopefully what they want to know about about singapore specifically but most importantly i think i hope that the characters speak to them and the stories of you know love and family and what it means to be like a child growing up in in any world and trying to figure out like what is important to you what your moral like system of beliefs are you know what do you do when you disagree with family i hope that will resonate with people yeah it will yeah straight up it will (laughs) that i know (laughs) that that i know with absolute certitude rachel hang thank you so much for joining us on port over the great reclamation is out now thank you thank you so much Hello readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of great books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of The Great Reclamation. I'm Mark coming to you from my Barnes & Noble store in Cincinnati, Ohio, and joined by my very favorite book buddy, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Mark. I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Leewood, Kansas. So we've got a couple of great books to talk about. I'm going to go ahead and just dive right in. I'm very excited for this book and The more I read up on it, the more I kept thinking about a specific story in Anthony Doerr's uh, short story collection, The Shell Collector, namely the title story, The Shell Collector. My brain kept pulling back to this specific story. I don't want to get into too many details. I want everybody to read this book in general because I love Anthony Doerr and this book is sublime. But the story really talks about a man whose gifts with nature clash with the needs of man. And I feel like that's a nice sort of companion or maybe like an aperitif to the Great Reclamation. All of the stories in this collection are really lovely. The way that he talks about awe is very evident in a lot of his writing. He is somebody who is very curious, somebody who really is able to sit in a situation or a moment or a a vision that really transcends and makes you kind of take your breath in. And I think the stories in this collection have a lot of moments like that where the characters are faced with something grander than themselves and are able to not only witness, but to really partake in a way that I think is very intimate uh, and um, also very universal. I just enjoy the way that he writes. Uh, He can turn a phrase really nicely, but I think everybody can use a moment to bask. And I think the world offers up so many lovely things. And a collection like this, I think, is a way to kind of give some permission to just remember those things and that the world can be certainly cruel and dark, but it can also be absolutely stunning and lovely and to not forget those moments. So please check out The Shell Collector by Anthony Doerr. The title story alone is worth the price of admission but the collection itself is truly stunning. So check it out. Jamie, what do you have for us? Uh, Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm going to jump on the Anthony Doerr bandwagon too. He's such a thoughtful writer and uh, that's a great recommendation. Unsurprising. (laughs) I was thinking about Rachel Hing's book and if you were moved by her writing and the combination of personal family story, illicit love, political drama, kind of all rolled up into one, I think you'd find a lot to like in Arundhati Roy's Booker Prize winning novel, The God of Small Things, which is set in India during a time of great unrest uh, at the end of the 1960s. This is a beautifully written book. Um, It is a really special book with with special prose. And it's, it's been compared to Faulkner and to Dickens. It is a family, an epic family drama that centers around a pair of fraternal twins, Esta and Rahel, who were seven years old in 1969 Kerala during a sort of communist uprising. At the time in India, there are just many rules in place about consorting with what they would call undesirables or marrying outside your family's faith or outside your caste. And so the twins' family dynamics are extremely complicated to begin with, Um, And then when you add in the political layers, it takes things to a very heightened place. Um, So the twins find themselves in the middle of this great conflict between their grandfather, who's a rich rubber planter, and their divorced mother, who has a 
romantic relationship with an untouchable member of the lowest caste in India. Her parents are horrified by this, and the situation begins to spiral out of control as the her twins are in a car with their aunt um, when it is surrounded by a group of political protesters and their aunt is humiliated by the mob. The twins believe they spot this untouchable man, um, who they were actually very fond of, uh, in the crowd. And they're saying that sets off a chain reaction in their lives um, that they are still suffering from when they come together as adults to recall this story uh, later in the 1990s. So the it's kind of a dual perspective, uh, dual timeline in this book. It's a complex novel. There are a lot of twists and turns, and some of those are devastating. Plenty of them are hopeful. And this mix of politics and forbidden love and discrimination and family complexities really makes for a compelling read. It's richly rewarding for readers who are willing to kind of jump in and and just let the the beautiful prose wash over them. So that's God of Small Things. Excellent. Good choice. It's, it's sort of like a modern day fine balance. Well, that is all we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Pour It Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Jamie. You can follow my home store at BN Leewood KS. That's all we have for today. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.